let's look at uh, what we can do about these things and how we look, see the, the, the startup ecosystems and how they can be better understood. So for the most part, um, ecosystems are very messy. They are very, very difficult to approach. They're not clear who is who, what is what, what is relevant for me, what is relevant today, what is relevant tomorrow, when is something available, what criteria do I need to fit, uh, is it free, does it cost money, um, and, and, and so forth. And what we want to bring is more systematic approach to start putting these things in, in order and, and find a, a more better way to structure and direct, uh, create directories and lists and, and ability to connect the, those services and those who use the services. So we'll look at this uh, through these three keywords and uh, related ecosystems lens. So there's innovation itself and therefore there's innovation ecosystem. There's entrepreneurship on its own and there's entrepreneurship ecosystem. And then there's startup ecosystem. So what is the kind of logic to understand the relationship and the differences between them? So we'll start with the innovation that usually lives in functions of research and development. So this research and development can be in a university, in a separate lab, it can be a part of the company, it can be uh, uh, an open research lab, it can be even the research and development that an individual does in context of their studies or, or research project or even for for independent project as a private person considering starting their own company. Entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial people, on the other hand, includes of course all of the types of entrepreneurs, not only those building startups, not only those doing innovation, but also all the lawyers, uh, consultants, accountants, um, those who start restaurants, barbers of capsid drivers, um, and, and, and all types of small business owners, manufacturing uh, facilities, designers, um, and so forth. So, of course, there's a whole set of entrepreneurial people in, in, in a broader entrepreneurship ecosystem. So, these two elements are the ingredients for the innovation on its own and entrepreneurship on its own. Within the innovation ecosystem, there is, of course, uh, talent, there's scientists, researchers, uh, those who create theories, uh, research on, on, on various different topics. Uh, on the other side, we have analysts, experts, planners, corporate people, attorneys. This is just to give an idea of the type of people on theoretical and ac academic and research side, and then on, on one hand also on the business side. When we look at on the entrepreneurship ecosystem, we have the practical operational people. We have more of the entrepreneurial types, risk takers, doers, multi-talents, makers. And then on the other hand, we have those who focus on specific business functions like developers, designers, hustlers, consultants, experts of any specific business topic or manufacturing process or technology or whatnot. And when we combine these elements and ingredients from both sides, we have the innovation ecosystem and we have the entrepreneurship ecosystem overlapping. And here's where the startups come into picture. It is really in the center of utilizing all of these pools of resources of people and, um, and uh, different uh, elements for innovation or potential innovation. So these are really the ingredients for, for enabling the startups um, and where the, where the different types of talent and people and assets accumulate. So when we open this up a bit more broadly, we can see that startup ecosystem 
it is own, it, it, it is its own ecosystem that is overlapping and and, and crossing uh, both of the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem where what makes it different is this uh, uh, life cycle this uh, startup development phases that is a key to understand what is happening within the startup ecosystem so the most attractive items from innovation ecosystem, the most ambitious people from entrepreneurial ecosystem, all services, activities, items, and people that are part of the startup growth journey at different development phases. So basically this is how we can kind of outline a startup ecosystem. <clears throat> and this, the point of this is to help bring some kind of way and, and structure to understand where does you know startup ecosystem end and where does innovation ecosystem start and, and uh, why are they different and why can they why they can and why they should be considered as separate things so within the startup ecosystems then the startups are really seeing within and between uh, the interactions of people and, uh, and different type of knowledge and resources for, for ideation and, in, in, and um, for potential innovations. So they are fed by the best ingredients. On one hand, that is research findings. On one hand, that is existing products or other products in other markets. On other hand, it's the problems and challenges, for example, that the bigger companies are facing and that they know the, what the market is missing and communicating those needs more into, um, into uh, hands and eyes of, um, uh, of, of the, the new innovators. So within those uh, development phases, there are these three key ingredients or three uh, key development phases that are the formation phase, validation phase, and growth phase. And each of these phases actually have uh, very key activities that the startup needs to focus on. So first of all, to, to pass the formation phase, the startup actually needs to born. So there actually needs to be a startup in some shape or form. And, and uh, it doesn't necessarily even exist, even if the company would be registered, because that doesn't yet uh, tell anything about the team or the potential innovation it has. So the really core essence of this formation phase is to, to, to create a, uh, like a founder shareholder agreement, usually, that basically de defined what is the ownership levels of part uh, co-founders, what is the co-founding structure, what is their roles, responsibilities, uh, ownership rights, um, vesting of the shares, what are the IPRs that the company is developing, uh, either what it has when it starts, what is the IPRs that it develops, whether that's software, whether that's a business model, whether whatever that is. Those are the essence that are key ingredients and the validation that the startup actually has something and it has its foundation solid to be able to move to the next phase that is all about validating the, 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 the concept of the product of the innovation itself uh, through a product market fit exercise which usually happens in the form of lean startup and the related concepts and tools and finally, once there's validation and there's clear product market fit, it is ready for scaling and not before. Before that, all the time is necessarily to spend on learning and iterating and finding what is the scalable product and service. Then the growth phase is all about making it scalable, finding the processes, finding the most effective ways of delivering that value that product or service to customers with the associated business model and to be able to build and grow an organization to be able to support and execute that. So that involves all kinds of things that uh, the bigger companies have 
where a startup has to create all of those at the same time as they are trying to grow their uh, business side and customer base. So these are three different, very, very different uh, phases, and it's very important. But at the same time, it's um, almost uh, freeing the mind because you don't have to worry about the next steps if you are not able to pass the previous one. At the same time, once you pass the previous one, you can almost forget everything from the past and focus only on the phase you are at the moment. So there, this helps to categorize the progress uh, because anyone who has been working with startups has built their startups themselves know that there's so many balls in the air all the time and you have really hard time figuring out what you should be focusing on, on at any uh, specific phase or not even understanding the phases themselves. So the, the three higher level uh, phases can be in an ecosystem context considered as a funnel. How much is their startups flowing at the formation phase? How many of them are maturing to validation phase? How many of them are uh, moving to growth phase? And within each of these three phases, there is kind of like an entry and exit points uh, of each that help bring ability to categorize and further measure uh, what's happening in the ecosystem itself. And here is a, a, a statistical perspective into, into uh, the startup ecosystem's kind of annual uh, volume snapshot. And at the same time, it communicates a type of maturity development um, in an ecosystem that, uh, that usually exists. And on the other hand, it kind of gives a snapshot of, of uh, how much there is volume at any given um, state. And of course, these numbers are very um, uh, averaged out from several different ecosystems as well as from several different ecosystem maturity levels. So this is just an indicative more to communicate the conversion rates and the level of, uh, for example, the level of support functions needed and the type of support functions needed and the way of delivery needed to help cater uh, these types of uh, volumes. So if you want to multiply this number with you know, 5, 10, 15, depending on the population side, size, um, then, then you can also get some perspective into the types of numbers uh, needed. So the ecosystem organizations are, are vast and, and uh, they all cater for different types of functions or they different, uh, uh, cater for same type of function but with the different type of offering. For example, uh, in case of investors, there's of course accelerators provide uh, funding, VCs provide funding, angels provide funding, crowdfunding platforms provide funding, and then there are the traditional finance institutions. They all provide funding, but very different type. In addition, there are you know, the physical settings, the office space offering, co-working space uh, offering. There are a mix of these who provide both the space and expertise in a very open format, and there are those who provide it in a very packaged format, or they have those who have uh, entry criteria and they also have exit criteria that you can come in if you are at this phase but you have to leave when you reach this phase and so forth. But the challenge with this is that they are very custom so there isn't like uh, more standards in place or there isn't more communication standards in place and that just makes things more difficult to everyone and this is easiest to experience if you move away from your own ecosystem and you try to enter another ecosystem in another city or a country. Within the ecosystem organization, there are of course many types of roles from entrepreneurs to future entrepreneurs, the current talent, startups at their different development phases, um, startup team members from co-founders to other core management, um, the support functions on the private side, the accountants, the lawyers, the consultants, 
um, experts and advisors, uh, researchers, and so forth. As well as, of course, all the support personnel from the, the support organizations. So it's really formed with people and startups at their various stages and various types in a location, usually in the physical form, usually considered at the, at the city ecosystem level, but of course also can be extended into in the virtual ecosystem and also of course that extends to national level, regional level um, and of course also to global level. But in different levels there are totally different types of functions that are relevant and also for what type of um, companies usually. And then in addition there are uh, business vertical ecosystems that then uh, cross cut through these geographical uh, types of ecosystems as well. So the interaction between the startups and the ecosystems <clears throat> is that startups develop within the different interactions through different services within the ecosystems themselves. The more dynamic, transparent and uh, balanced the ecosystem is, the more successful startup ecosystem can create. So let's look at the, the experience of navigating through um, startup ecosystem from the eyes of an entrepreneur or other uh, individual that is looking to build a venture or is part of the venture. And on the other hand, look at the, the ecosystem experience from the support organization uh, perspective. So, this is the common perspective for everyone when you look at the, the ecosystem the first time. It doesn't matter whether you are coming from another country to a, to a new city and you're trying to see what that is. Maybe you are growing your business into that city or maybe you are uh, looking founders from that city. Maybe you're looking for investors from that city. Maybe you're looking for support from that city or whether you have actually lived in that country for the whole of your life but you never considered entrepreneurship. It's the same thing. When you start to look at the entrepreneurship or startup as your potential uh, option, the whole world opens up and it looks as confusing even if you have lived there all of your, for you for your life. It's the same perspective for everyone. The bigger the ecosystem is, the more active it is, the, at the same time, the more messy it can be if there is no uh, effort put in to trying to organize it. From the support organization perspective, uh, as long as it's in their own service, it can be seen as a net process. So the target is that uh, whether that's individual mentoring service or whether that's an accelerator program or whether that's an event, the key is that people come with certain expectations uh, meeting certain type of profile or criteria, and through the experience of the support service, event, mentoring, accelerator program, they leave with more mature uh, capabilities, uh, improved knowledge, or inspired, or whatever the target of that service function is. But at the same time, because these service functions are not individually um, uh, the only service functions there, but there are vast amounts of different services available, often by, by different organizations and many organizations having multiple services. Uh, what gets confusing is and not understanding what the other services in the ecosystem is, what do they actually cater for. So it's sometimes as hard to read into other support functions, even being a support fun provider yourself, that it is for a, for a startup or an entrepreneur to, to look at these services. At the same time, there is no connectivity between knowing where the customers come from or what happens to the customers one year or two years after the service has been provided from your side. And this makes it very difficult to report results, uh, for example, justifying the financing of the support function. 
Um, at the same time, it's impossible to put the services in under one house or put them in, in one linear process because there are different needs depending on the type of innovation being built or depending on the type of startup um, in question, depending on uh, the, the type of expertise that the teams already have uh, and so forth. And even uh, depending on the time of the year, what services actually are available uh, for them. So the journey through these um, support functions vary a lot and as such, they cannot simply be put in a one process map and say, here's how it works. So this means that the customer experience between this support, uh, experiencing these services that perhaps sometimes they consume even parallel, that when they are going through an accelerator program, during that time, they also visit five other training programs external to that accelerator program or when they are in the co-working space, they get random buffet of training services catered for them, uh, while at the same time they are sitting in one location for two years. So there's a vast list of challenges to, to face and typical things to cover from startup ecosystems, including multiple people and user needs, mapping this out, uh, different types of people, profiles from different age, from, from um, 18 or younger to, to someone who is on their 50s building their first company, um, and all the genders and different uh, um, educational levels, cultural backgrounds and so forth. There's NGOs, there's private companies, there's hybrid organizations, there's periodical funding, there's sustainable funding, uh, and so forth. I'm not going to read all of this, but this, uh, it gives a snapshot of types of challenges to work on. In addition, uh, what the linear world has created is a lot of organizational silos, whereas the digital world and whereas the, 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 the kind of uh, this cross-cutting open innovation type of environment uh, keeps um, crossing without even thinking. But at the same time, there's a certain group of people who comfortably sit in their silos and don't really have ability even necessarily to expand their uh, reads across different silos. So there are silos that are smaller silos are uh, between strategy, those who work on the strategies for a specific organization and those who operatively execute them, then there are uh, gaps, uh, silos between the plans and the actual reality, what happens. There's gaps between services and customers. There's silos and gaps between short-term thinking and long-term targets. Um, uh, there's gaps between business verticals there's gaps between public and private side, there's top-down thinking, there's bottom-up thinking, more grassroots bottom-up activity to more policy-making, top-down thinking. So these silos, they are smaller. Then there's bigger ones between support organizations, how to make um, our offerings more matching and, and catering uh, for our shared customer base. There's uh, gaps between cities, uh, even between neighboring cities. Sometimes they're competing uh, with their services uh, within the same ecosystem almost because of the economic benefits that they're trying to get from the companies. And definitely at international scale, all of the, comp all of the cities and countries are trying to attract talent and companies to come, come to their cities and to their ecosystems. Whereas from an entrepreneur's perspective, you just want to expand to as many countries and cities as possible. You are not necessarily interested in shopping around where you want to have your main operations. <clears throat> There's a gap between locals and global. Uh, those who have non-digital mindset, those who have very digital mindset, uh, 
definitely between software applications not communicating with, with, it, with each other and databases, so data structures. What data does one organization have that they could contribute to another one? 100% uh, sure that those data sets don't match and uh, there needs to be something worked between those. So these are all, all uh, very uh, universal challenges, but at the same time, they are all things where solutions uh, exist and that can be overcome as long as there's systematic focus on working on these. So as a general thing, uh, what the breaking of the silos or connecting the silos is not is what tends to happen a lot, that people talk about it and they even have uh, meetings together and they agree to work together and they talk about collaboration and even sometimes create memorandum of understanding and agreements about working together. Uh, the problem is here that it happens either at strategic level or it happens at very um, at level that the reality doesn't support. So the budget don't support, uh, the, the shared metrics don't support, the processes don't support. So basically this keeps happening more and more, but in the practice doesn't follow. So it means that if there is no natural way for collaborating that fits to ongoing daily activities and responsibilities, it simply will be overdriven by other priorities. They never get enough attention because they are not measured, they are not, the budget is not allocated for those. Uh, so just, it has to happen uh, across the board. If there is no common language, if there is no common clear vision, why we would do this, uh, a more distant target that we are all working towards, then it's much harder to find the, the rationale in the daily operations. And definitely, if it's not cross-board from strategy to budget to operating uh, and so forth, it doesn't, it doesn't make it possible to just maintain that relationship in a useful level that customers can experience it uh, just by those very active and caring people that do that on the individual level and individual networks uh, between the organizations. And the key is really that if there is no measures and there is no results tracked, then basically those activities are just something that is um, always talked about and is referred to, but it actually is not really anything that creates real impact. And it definitely takes an extra effort and therefore it needs to be a, a separate decision uh, that is put through strategy, operations, given budgets, and put measures in place. So only the real operative cooperation actually works. Creating shared targets, uh, creating shared working space and tools, physical or virtual. Uh, so we have seen successful cases, even between uh, big public organizations where they have created a separate space and uh, uh, dedicated days for people from cross organizations to come together to work together not as one project not as you know something um, individually created but something that is permanent and then creating uh, the tools that really track and make the, the effort much easier In addition to, to lighter opportunities is to create the shared things that are developed together uh, from own perspective, but at the same time contributed uh, for collective use. And this is exactly how uh, open source software projects work. This is how creative commons work. And this is also what we utilize in everything that we do. So regardless of, of the multitude of different items to work on, uh, the startup ecosystem can be identified, they can be mapped out, and they can be measured 
and they can be developed and improved. So it's not uh, an, an activity that, that couldn't be resolved. Uh, one of the case examples I like to I like to use as an analogy here is that that uh, before you know the first airports were built, solving the whole how planes leave, what kind of planes can land, and, and the whole airport logistics and the whole flight system. If if someone would have said we're going to create this type of thing, you know that exists today, uh, people would. May, may be considered that almost impossible. But today, I mean, how it has iter iteratively been developed long term, nobody really even thinks about it, how much happens in the whole uh, international uh, uh, travel system. In the local context, that can be taken, the, the whole public transportation system. And, uh, and so the startup ecosystems for sure uh, while can be considered complex, I would say it's not even close to complexity as, as some of those systems, specifically when there was no knowledge available when they were created. 